Hello, hello. So, I'll be trying this new form as a podcast. And today we're going to be going over um, Harry Potter, the third book, Prisoner of Azkaban. Now, the one thing I liked about this book, just right off the bat, is that we get to know a little bit more about Harry's parents, which we've only heard about good things about them or more or less the good opinions people have on them but we haven't actually seen anything as to uh, who they are as they as they, as people when they were still alive and so it's kind of great to see how harry kind of gets to learn more about them and also he starts to identify himself more with his parents rather than just being uh, people that have already died that are already gone he starts to feel that he is closer to them as compared to ever before in his 12 13 years of life so real quickly we start off the book where harry as always the summers are eventful and so uh, a family of the Dursleys by uh, vernon's side not his side uh, his sister, to be more exact, comes and visits, uh, goes to visit them. Now, she has never liked Harry in particular, and she, anytime she has the opportunity, she torments him with her dog, or with, with one of her dogs. Uh, while Dudley gets to, you know, he gets the, the money, he gets the, like, uh, the gifts and the toys and all this stuff. And so, Harry this is his chance to kind of explore more the wizarding world and by what i mean is that because he's going to be a third year third years have this ability to go to a nearby town now close to hogwarts called hogsmeade and hogsmeade is the only 100 percent wizarding village that still exists in at least in the united kingdom and being so close to a school there are weekends that are assigned so that the students can actually go down to the village and spend the afternoon uh, outside the school. However, they need a permission slip, and this is where Harry comes into a predicament. Um, immediately with uh, Uncle Vernon, Vernon not wanting to do anything that might give Harry happiness, but he also wants to keep Harry, as he puts it, Harry's anomaly, right? A secret. He doesn't want to reveal that Harry has, is a wizard or has magic, which Harry also does, doesn't want to do, but still, it's more of a threat for Vernon because anything that makes that causes a perception of abnormality, it's a greater threat than if you had like a, I don't know, like a gun or something. And so, with that in mind, Harry tries to behave himself, but Aunt Marge, Vernon's sister. Uh, goes overboard uh, talking about how Harry's dad probably was living off the government and how Harry's mom uh, s somewhere around the lines of if there's something wrong with the, the, the dog there's something wrong with the, with the bitch or the female dog you know so there has to be something wrong there and that's what Gary had gets Harry into this state and Armarge blows up like a balloon and you know harry in this kind of rush of emotions but also in this rush of danger because as he already experienced the previous year he he knows that if he does magic he can get in trouble and since he already did magic before well not him but since he has been he has already been accused once of doing magic well he doesn't he decides not to stay there and just kind of run off before anything else can happen Especially that he doesn't want anybody to touch his wand. And so he grabs his stuff. He leaves the home. And uh, this is where we come to find out a very neat thing about this whole experience. And by that I mean the, um, the night bus. A night bus or however you pronounce it. Um, which is basically this bus that can take you anywhere. You just have to light up with your wand up in the sky and that signals for the bus to come down and pick you up and take you anywhere you want to go he reaches the leaky cauldron 
over in uh, at the entrance of Diagon Alley. And surprisingly enough, uh, Fudge, who is the Minister of Magic, was already expecting him. And he wants to kind of explain how, you know, he's glad he's there and that he's all right. Obviously, Harry's a little bit suspicious at this point. And being that he already heard about this, um, at, at, about this convict who had escaped prison called Sirius Black, he kind of thought it might have to have something to do with that. Especially when, um, when the minister, I think he mentioned something about Black. Anyway, uh, Harry does say, oh, I, I, I know what you're talking about, like Sirius Black. And that's when Fudge goes, so you know who he is. Which obviously Harry doesn't, and Fudge doesn't want Harry to know because he doesn't want Harry to actually start looking for trouble. In any case, Harry ends up staying um, in the Lucky Cauldron uh, during the entire duration of the of the holidays. He gets his books. He gets to spend time doing his homework. He actually um, enjoys time over at the uh, Fleur and I forget the name of the shop, but. It's where he gets his uh, shakes. And the owner, being very uh, good with history, he starts kind of helping him out with his homework, to, uh, talking about the historical events and, and all of that. So that's actually pretty neat as well. And he does meet up with Herm um, Ron and Hermione, who eventually meet up with him to get their school stuff. And one of the books, interesting enough, that they are required, starts to bite them back. It's called the Monster Book of Monsters, which they don't know who is it for. They they understand it's for their class on magical beasts, but um, but yeah, that's kind of like an interesting scene that happens. Even even the book, uh, the bookstore owner starts getting worried because he sees that there's three of them, so he gets ready to get three books that try to bite his hand off. But fortunately, Harry had already received one for his birthday. So everything is okay. Now, um, we go forward into uh, the school year. And one thing, it's one of those occasions where Harry and Hermione, that get uh, put aside. And it's kind of those first events that you don't notice until later on in the series, but where Ron starts feeling left out. Because Ron wanting to be with his friends, obviously, he starts. They um, Professor McGonagall tells him, "Well, it's only concerning these two. You have to go back to the right hall uh, to enjoy the rest of the ceremony." And we don't hear at that moment what why Hermione was there, but at least for Harry, uh, he he actually gets told to, in in essence, to behave to not look for trouble and when Harry points out that you know he doesn't have a signature well it's not much of a problem for them because they wouldn't want him to going to the village in any case and again it's kind of circles back to Sirius Black but nobody is actually telling him anything it's still quite a secret because why should he care about Sirius Black but also what aren't they telling him so they continue on and they start the, the, the semester, or the school year, I should say. And we end up with a big surprise because, you see, the reason why the students needed the Monster Book of Monsters is because Hagrid is the new uh, Magical Creatures instructor or professor. And because of that, well, obviously, he thought it would be a joke. Which nobody laughs at, but so it's it's actually kind of funny if, if looking at it from the sidelines, because of course, anything that's kind of like the most vicious, Hagrid is going to see it as like a cute puppy. If you don't believe me, well, go back to the first book and you see Fluffy, the three, the giant three-headed dog, or even Aragog, which was Hagrid's pet during his time in Hogwarts. Hogwarts. And also, you know, his love for dragons. So you can see the trend. In any case, the first lesson, everybody's worried about the first lesson, what are they going to be seeing. And 
this is when they meet the hippogriffs and the hippogriffs are they're a a sort of chimera uh, for those who are not familiar with the word chimera are animals that are kind of made with different body parts of different animals so in this case hippogriffs have the body of a horse with the front legs of a lion, the head of an eagle, as well as the wings of an eagle. And this is actually pretty interesting because, as Hagrid points out, they're the only domestic... Well, no, I don't think they're the only domestic, domesticated kind, but anyway. Uh, the thing is, you have the hippogriffs, and the way he introduces them is that they will, they are prideful. These creatures have a lot of pride. And so when he requests students to kind of step up and kind of reach out, he says, well, get near the hippogriff, get close to him, bow your head. If they bow back, they are giving you permission to go ahead. And at first, nobody wants to try. And actually, Harry finds himself being the one front and center. And so he's the one that... It, and he also wants to kind of make ensure that this first lesson is a success because Harry and the gang really do love Harry they want him to do good and so Harry does accept being the first person he goes ahead, bows his head the hippogriff is taking quite a bit of time but eventually it does bow its head and Harry is able to even write it and it's quite the exhilarating feeling or so, I, you know, when you read it and when you see the movie, it kind of seems like it would be a fun experience to write the hippogriff. And that's when things kind of start going wrong, or one of the first things that start going wrong. Because, you see, uh, in this class, it's both the Gryffindors and the Slytherins. And so, Draco Malfoy, obviously, not liking Hagrid, because Hagrid's not like a pure wizard, or like a full pure wizard, uh, he considers him like a freak. So he does whatever he can. And in this case, what he ended up doing was he antagonized one of the hippogriffs who had given him permission to come near, cl to come closer. Because of this, the hippogriff attacked him. And, uh, that, well, the name of this uh, hippogriff is Buckbeak. Buckbeak ended up uh, scratching him. Not so bad, but... He did scratch him a little. Hagrid had to stop Buckbeak and take Draco to Madame Pomfrey. No, is it Pomfrey? Well, basically the nursing, the nursing wing at Hogwarts. He had to take him to a nurse. This is not a very good start of class. Or, well, at least for Hagrid. But, you know, uh, as we'll kind of see as we go along... It does pose quite a bit of a problem until the very end. Now, again, everything is starting new. And for the third year straight, first you had uh, Professor Quirrell, who ended up being in league with Voldemort. He was actually even the host for Voldemort. Um, then you had uh, Professor Lockhart, who ended up uh, being demented by his own spell. That actually brings me to another point. So... In the, at the, it wasn't exactly at the school yet, but when Harry and the gang were writing on the Hogwarts Express, they do find this interesting character, a full-grown man in one of the, in one of the uh, carts or one of the, um, I, I guess you can say the small sections of the dream, and what it was well for one it's interesting because in that in, the, in that train only children are allowed, are allowed only the Hogwarts students but also he looks very scruffed like he had been going through a rough time and in the middle of the journey to Hogwarts the train stops and everything starts feeling cold the lights go out and there is even a strange presence something that has been had been creeping out everybody in the train and in Harry's case they described that it 
it was this creature that seemed to float on in the air and when stretched out with long bony uh, hands and arms and as it goes grows goes nearer to Harry Harry starts feeling weak he starts losing consciousness and he starts hearing voices not that he was crazy but he starts hearing screams more specifically the screams of a woman and also this green flashlight now this also doesn't get explained until later on but harry does begin to kind of notice the more that he's exposed to these creatures known as the mentors that the voices that he hears are actually the last moments of life of his mother so the voices he hears are Voldemort's and also Lily's, which kind of is kind of like a bad, like a sad thing if you think about it. Because yes, it's sad that they died, but imagine he every time he gets close to the Dementors, he relive he relives the experience as he was a baby. Because one thing you know, he was a baby, he might not remember, but re- having to relieve relive this experience through the Dementors as a growing a growing uh, well he's a 13 year old so he's not precisely like a child child but he is now able to kind of process the emotions and so this really gets you know it it can traumatize people it can cause quite a shock um but because of the same th- of, of the same thing he also loses consciousness and it turns out that the a grown man he he actually uh, got the dementor to turn away and he also gave Harry some chocolate and was also the, the new hired professor for uh, defense against the dark arts in place of Professor Lockhart who is no longer there all this was to go back to the point where uh, where was I I ah, guess so Lockhart got demented. Yes, pun intended. Um, when he his spell backfired, and then you have this new professor, Professor Lupin, the man that was on the train, the man who uh, was able to fight back against the Dementor. Now, Professor Lupin is an interesting professor. In the first class, he actually they, he didn't have them uh, open up their book but rather he started off with an with a practice with an exercise and so the lesson was about uh, what's what's the name um, Bogarts now Bogarts are these magical creatures that nobody really knows what they look like because they do live in the dark however uh, when they are in the light or when they are when they are seen they adopt the shape of the person who is seeing them, their worst fear. And it can, you know, it can vary from person to person. Like for one of the students, it was a mummy. For another one was, um, well, not even going to say it because that's also very terrifying, terrifying for me. Uh, but you also have like a clown and, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, ooh, just real quick. Neville's was actually the best one because uh, for Neville, his worst fear was a combination of uh, Professor Snape and his grandmother. But what Professor Lupin had him do, and he was the first one who was going to step up, was um, uh, picture um, Professor Snape, but picture Professor Snape with his grandmother's clothes. And the fact that this causes is that it causes laughter, which is the way that you fight against Bogarts. And so... When you are confronted with a Bogart, you cast a spell called Ridiculous. They change shape, and because you're laughing and you're no longer terrified, they stop having power and they go by. They, you know, they go away. And so everybody was taking turns, and then when it was Harry's turn, uh, things go for the worst because he doesn't allow Harry, Professor Lupin, I mean, he doesn't allow Harry to continue because he's afraid that Harry's fear is going to be Lord Voldemort. Which wasn't the case, as Harry then later um, clarified with Professor Lupin, 
where Harry's fear wasn't so much for Lord Voldemort, who he had already confronted twice, but or three times, technically, but rather the Dementors, because the Dementors are the ones that cause him actually more pain, and those are the ones that cause him more fear, which Professor Lupin makes the point of saying it's a white choice, because basically he chooses to be afraid of fear, of fear itself. And so, as we go on, uh, we we start hearing more news about sightings of Sirius Black. Especially sightings near Hogsmeade and kind of going closer to the school. And nobody is understanding why. I mean, they, they only guess that it's kind of like a random and by chance that he's coming near. But... For, there are some people that are kind of onto this fact because, and even Draco uh, taunts Harry about this by saying, Oh, if I were you, I mean, I'm surprised that you're still here. If I were you, I would go hunt him down and stuff like this. Because Harry doesn't really know what is going on, he doesn't even know why Sirius Black would want to go after him. And so, as we come up to the first Hogsmeade visit, Harry tries one more time, but Professor McGonagall denies him any signature because it has to be from a guardian or from a parent. And because she's neither, well, she's just not going to sign anything. She's very precise with the rules. So Harry has to now stay. Now, because Harry has to now stay, he gets into this kind of grumpy attitude. And... So eventually, what will end up happening is that uh, Fred and George, they notice how kind of down he looks every time that um, every time that the weekend turns into like a Hogsmeade weekend. So they offer him a gift. A gift that they say has helped them a lot of times to do their uh, pranks. And the gift is a, an old parchment. Now... There's nothing special that you could see immediately. However, this parchment, when you pronounce a certain kind of like a key phrase, I certainly swear I am up to good. That's when it reveals itself to be the Marauder's Map. And the Marauder's Map is an interesting parchment, an interesting map, because it maps the whole school. However, it also gives you the details of who is actually in what part of the school. So it'll give you the name of who is in the Great Hall, who is in, um, I don't know, in the library. It gives you the locations of everybody, every single person in the school or on the school grounds. Now, they do point out that on as an exit, there's like several exits. However, a few of them have been closed in. There's one that um, that Filch, the caretaker of the school, uh, knows about, and but there is one more exit that leads you into I think it is Honeydukes um, over in Hugsmeade. So it it is a um, well, it it is quite the um, exit, right? And so they leave him off with the map. And, well, you, you can kind of guess what's going to happen. On his next chance, he actually does use the map to exit the school. Not only that, but he also takes brings with him his uh, invisibility cloak so that nobody can see him. And so he does reach out. He does um, reach Hogsmeade. He does uh, find Ron and Hermione. At this point, he has left... The invisibility cloak over at Honeydukes, or at the entrance of um, that passageway. Now, this is kind of key because over in the Three Broomsticks, this kind of pubish uh, area. I, I think it is like a pub, but um, it is open to the public in general. So you do have the students drinking their butterbeer and other things over there, and so. He does overhear when he is in 
the three in broomsticks, he overhears the professors talking about Sirius Black. And that's where it is revealed that Sirius Black is the reason why Voldemort was able to find Harry and his parents and ultimately ended up with his parents being killed. Understandably, Harry is very angry at this and he now understands why they are so insistent on him staying at school and not doing anything dangerous like he was doing right now. Now, this causes quite a bit of conflict and it does end up with Hermione um, kind of talking to to Professor McGonagall about the map. And, well, it wasn't Professor McGonagall. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking of something else, but no, um, this this leads to Hermione tr uh, talking Harry into turning in the map. Now, on one night, he does read this very particular name because it's a name that he has heard of somebody that died, that was killed by Sirius Black, which was the reason why he was convicted into Azkaban this kind of fortress in the middle of nowhere that is guarded by Dementors. And, it, and it's very much a maximum security type of prison. Now, the name that he sees is the name of the victim, Peter Pettigrew. And when he starts looking for Peter Pettigrew, he doesn't necessarily find him, but he is found out by Professor Lupin. Now, before Professor Lupin reaches Harry, uh, Professor Snape, who, along with the other professors, are kind of doing their rounds to make sure that um, Sirius Black doesn't go into the school, he finds Harry with the parchment. Except that the parchment was blank at that moment. It really wasn't uh, visible that it was a map. But Professor Snape kind of had an idea of what it could be. Now, Professor Lupin comes in, he kind of saves the day by saying, oh, I'll, I'll check it as I'm the professor of defense against the dark arts. And um, the thing is, Professor Lupin already knows what it is. And he tells Harry, I don't know where you got this. I am seriously disappointed that you didn't bring it to me. Because this could be how Prof uh, Sirius Black comes into a school. It can be uh, dangerous in the wrong hands. Okay, fair enough. So, he loses the map, and Harry no longer is able to kind of go anywhere. And it also causes contention, because now Ron is mad at Hermione, even though Hermione didn't really do anything. That sort of thing. But, she does do something that gets both Harry and Hermione, I mean, Ron and Harry, very, very much, uh, let's say, uh, they give her the silence treatment. And that is, um, during an accident in one of the Quidditch matches, Harry gets blown towards the Whipping Willow. Now, it wasn't the fault of anybody in particular. It was a very windy and stormy day. However, the Dementors that were left in charge of kind of protecting the school, um, as guards, if you will, they had come over to the match because there was a lot of people. And the mentors feed on people's emotions. And what ended up happening was that Harry lost consciousness. Uh, they were growing, uh, flying very close to him. And Harry ended up being blown to the Wamping Willow, the tree that had attacked Ron and him uh, kind of when they crashed into it the previous year. And not only that, but when Harry regains cautious, consciousness, his broomstick is in pieces. It is no longer able to be repaired. And so, because of that, he has no broomstick. He has to use one of the lesser quality broomsticks. However, he does receive a new broomstick in the mail. A new model of broomsticks called the Firebolt, which is much faster than the model he had, which was the Nimbus 2000. Now, the thing about the fireball is that he doesn't know who sent it and there was no letter. And so it's kind of very suspicious, especially 
because it could be from the mother and it could have been tampered so that Harry uh, gets killed. And so with this in mind, Hermione does talk to Professor McGonagall about the broomstick. And as much as it pains her because Professor McGonagall is very much a Quidditch fan, she takes away the broom for Harry's safety so it can be examined and you know, look for any jinxes and anything that might cause problems. So with all of that, you know, things are not that great with the gang. I don't know why they call them gang. Anyway. Now, as the, as the school year goes on and on, uh, we do reach the point in where Harry needs help because obviously the Dementors have gone close to Harry on several occasions. He needs to know how to defend himself. And so uh, Professor Lupin does teach Harry um, a way to defend himself. Uh, more specifically, he teaches Harry the spell, uh, the incantation called Spectral Patronus. And Spectral Patronus is a protective charm that it embodies the positive emotions, the emotions that the mentors can't feed on, of happiness, joy, you know, what is warm inside. And it embodies this this feeling and creates a protective barrier between the Dementor and the wizard or witch who is casting the spell. Now, it is an extremely complex, complex um, spell. When it's done right, it can seem more like a shield. But when it's done at a master level, the spell actually embodies in the form of an animal that is supposed to kind of represent the person who is casting the spell. And for everybody, it can be different. And it's not that one is more is better than the other. So uh, as an example, um, for, I don't know, for, um, kind of losing my words over here. Because it does kind of spoil, but uh, it can be in the form of an otter. It can be in the form of a jackrabbit. It can even be in the form of a dragon. So it, it really just depends on the person who is casting the spell. But it doesn't mean that one special person is better than the other. They all do the same thing. But anyway, so what ends up happening is that Harry does eventually learn how to cast a decent Patronus and he actually does cast one kind of so uh, you see in one of the matches that they had against I want to say Ravenclaw or Hufflepuffs um, Draco thought it would be a good idea to kind of scare them um, well scare him uh, pretending to be a Dementor so it was Draco and Crab and Goyle they, they basically got one on top of the other and along with an other students that kind of helped out so that there could be like two or three Dementors. Fake Dementors. And what ends up happening is that Harry casts the Spectral Personas, which tumbled them down to the ground and they got in trouble. Harry, it, after that, immediately catches the snitch and wins the game. So it was a momentous occasion. Pretty fun, actually. So now that we're talking about uh, a little bit about the spell, we have to also talk a little about what is going on at this point. Because you see, Harry does want to go after Sirius Black, but he doesn't. And you know, it does. It's kind of hard to explain what happens at this point, but. In, in in essence if you refer if you remember back um, at the very beginning of the of this I was talking about how in Hagrid's first class first lesson the hippogriff had hurt Draco and Draco was just purely theatrics he was okay it was more of a superficial scratch that he had uh, kind of provoked the Hippogriff to do. The Hippogriff, Buckbeak, was now being on, put on trial. 
during this whole time in the during the school year, there had been a trial, there had been an appeal. Basically, they and it and it really had a lot to do with um, Lucius Malfoy, Draco Swaller, who wanted to kill Buckbeak. He actually wanted him dead. He was going, no, he's a monster. He is a danger to all students. Kill that monster. So during this whole appeal process and everything, it, it failed. Uh, Buckbeak was sentenced to execution. So on this afternoon that we're talking about, Harry, Ron, and Hermione, now that they were on speaking terms, they went over to to be with Hagrid because they don't want to leave him alone once they execute Buckbeak it was going to, they knew it was going to be hard on him so they wanted to be there for him when the executioner arrives and is ready to just cut Buckbeak's head uh, something happens because as they are forced to hide and not reveal that they're there um because obviously it's not just the executioner you also have the minister you have professor dumbledore you have lucius malfoy that's there for some reason but they could really get in trouble and hagrid especially as being a professor he's supposed to take care of the students so they do hide um outside and as they do well they're able to kind of escape on the side well not escape but uh, go back to the school in case anybody says anything and they hear the, the sound the sound of the blade uh, cutting into wood and there was that however it's not that simple uh, several things start happening at once uh, one thing leads to the other in which uh Ron gets dragged into the Wampum Willow. And when I say inside, I do mean right inside underneath. Uh, apparently, there's this kind of... Uh, it has the shape of an acorn uh, at, the, at the base of the tree. And if you touch it, then the tree goes still. And you're able to actually go into the hole, which leads you into a different passage, passageway. And so as uh, Ron was being dragged, Harry and Hermione, they run after him. They go into the passageway. They end up in the Shrieking Shack, which... Shack. Shrieking Shack. Shrek. Shrieking Shack. Okay, that is a tongue twister. In any case, they do arrive to this location, uh, which... In Hogsmeade, they do refer to it as kind of like a haunted place because there's there were screams and all that. So they do say that it's haunted. And that's when they find that they are not alone. Uh, once they reach Ron, uh, Sirius Black reveals himself. Now, Sirius Black, he... Um, it's quite interesting because, well, he does seem a little bit mad he's not actually doing anything to harm them i mean he did hurt ron but and i should probably explain this because uh when i said that ron was being dragged if you've never read a book or seen the movie you gonna be wondering well how is it that he can pop up and just drag him over to a tree and the thing you need to know is that sirius black is what you call an animagus in animagus is a wizard who can at will transform him themselves into an animal and Sirius Black can transfigure himself basically into this large black fur dog now he had hurt to run without wanting to he was a little bit eager um, when he was dragging him uh, on by the leg but the leg so it wasn't that he was purposely trying to harm him it's just that as kind of like a consequence of dragging him over he did bite his leg and that's how ron is a little bit hurt but he other than that he's not trying to hurt the children the kids the gang 
I don't know what to call him. Anyway. Uh, so, Harry is very much upset. And he's to the point where he does want to kill Sirius. After, after all, he is in front of him. And he does get his chance to kind of uh, hit him and hurt him. Because, he, well, we've got to remember, he is responsible for his mom and dad dying. I mean, he is that reason. He is a vile uh, human being. He is what he hates at that moment. But at that moment, before Harry can actually do anything else, uh, Professor Lupin steps in. And Professor Lupin, oddly enough, he's conversing with Sirius Black as if they were old friends. Um, obviously, they are old friends. And as they come to explain, they were not just friends, they were also James's friends. James being Harry's father. And obviously, they also knew uh, Lily. This is where things uh, get into an interesting twist. Because they start talking about somebody. You found him. Yes. Is he here? Yes. Are you sure? Uh, what are you going to do? Etc. And when he points at Ron, it's not Ron that he's pointing at, but rather what Ron has in one of his pockets. And what Ron has in one of his pockets is his pet rat. Uh, his pet, the rat named Scabbers. Now, they think that he's being demented, that he's actually a little bit off. Which, to be honest, if you're surrounded by creatures that feed off negative emotions and you have to control your emotions, you are going to be a little bit unbalanced. Okay, now, that being, you know, putting that aside, they do, um, before they can actually reveal anything, Professor Snape also comes alive. By that, I mean, he barges in and he goes, ha-ha, I knew you were helping Sirius uh, get into the school. I knew that Sirius was going to come back. Oh, you're all going to be in trouble, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, Harry, kind of now softening up and trying to see more reason rather than going by anger, he does perform Expelling Marius, which is a spell that is meant to disarm another wizard from his wand. He gets a little too eager, and he's not the only one that does the spell. Um, Hermione and I think Ron also does it. So, uh, uh, needless to say, uh, Professor Snape does kind of lose consciousness, and Harry demands the story. So, the full story from what Harry had heard and was told was that it wasn't really Sirius who killed Harry's parents, he hadn't really betrayed anybody. Because of what was happening during those times where Lord Voldemort was killing everybody who was opposing him, Harry, uh, I mean, James and Lily, having opposed him many times, I think it was like three or four times, they went into hiding. And in order to stay hidden, they performed a concealment charm. A special type of charm where they're, you have this place, protected nobody can go in unless they know the location unless they're actually revealed by somebody else somebody known as the keeper now Sirius would have been the keeper however they kind of uh, in kind of this um, as a way to as as a diversion or however you want to call it they got Peter Pegrew, who was also a member of their fan group. They had him uh, become the keeper because they, everybody would have suspected Sirius as being the keeper, but nobody would have looked at Peter. And so what happened was that Peter Pettigrew was the one who told Lord Voldemort about the location to find uh, Lily and James. And that's how Voldemort was able to find them and kill them because they knew who, who nobody else knew really 
But because Sirius knew about this plan and knew that the only way that they could have been killed was if Peter Pettigrew had said anything, Sirius had confronted Peter. Peter was out in public and as a theatrics. He caused a major explosion which caused several loss of lives. And not even lives of just wizards, but of outside in general. So even non-wizards, muggles, were killed. He cut his own finger and he transfigured himself into a rat. And that was that. Hey, it rhymed. Now, the reason why he had cut his finger was so, to create the illusion that Sirius had killed him so bad that only a finger remained. That sort of situation. Not only this, but a little of a backstory with these transfigurations. Because it may seem that it's very common, but it really isn't. And I don't remember the amount of years, but they do at some point in the book refer how many years it's been since somebody has registered as being a an animagus because you by law that you have to register yourself if you're an animagus but the reason that had led to that was that lupin when the thing about lupin is that lupin is a werewolf and the reason why he has kind of gone through a rough, rough patch is that being a werewolf nobody wants to hire him so he has to he's basically homeless and without any money but also his transformations take a toll on him unlike an animagus a werewolf transforms against their own will they'll transform into the werewolf and so when Lupin was at school, the Shrieking Shrek was built and the tree, the Wampum Willow, was placed in that exit, in that passageway, passageway, to ensure that nobody follows him and gets trapped with the werewolf. And the Shrieking Shrek served for Lupin to be able to transform and not hurt anybody else. He would be alone during those transformations and nobody got hurt. It was built specifically for him. And because of the noises and the pain, people thought that it was hunted. So it kind of helped him out a bit because nobody would go near the shack. The shack. However, he never wanted to tell anybody. But obviously, Sirius, James, they kind of knew what was going on or knew something was going on. So when they found out that he was a werewolf, rather than doing what Lupin thought they were going to do by um, rejecting him and casting him outside, they actually went to help him out. And so they began this kind of long and sort of very complicated process of becoming an animagus. Uh, the Carlin Brothers, uh, which is a uh, YouTube channel with Jay and Ben, they actually discuss the process it's because it's not detailed in the book. It's more detailed on uh, Pottermore and like these other sites. So it's nothing really that is very much discussed, but it is kind of like a lengthy process, and not just that. But they also, um, well, they would transfer into animals that would help keep Lupin company. Because you see, werewolves are a danger to humans, not to other animals. And so each of the friends had their transformation Sirius was this giant black dog Peter was a rat which helped them kind of touch that nut that um, or acorn or he, he was able to actually touch that location in the tree that would make it stand still and also James would transform himself into a stag these animals would Keep him company, keep him safe, keep him in place. 
because Sirius being a big black dog and James being a stag, they're large animals, so they can, if anything were to happen, they were able to kind of keep him in place, keep him from going outside, keep him from kind of attacking anybody. Uh, this caused a problem because when Professor Snape, who was in the same school year, uh, kind of noticing something strange, I believe it was Sirius who kind of taunted him by saying, oh, you know, you should check what's going on at this day, at this time. And it was one of those trans transformation nights for Lupin. And Professor Snape was almost killed, but James did uh, kind of save his life. Uh, he did stop him and pulled him out. It, they didn't really detail what went on, but he did um, learn that Lupin was a werewolf, and ever since he's had like a grudge against him and the other people. Well, they've always he's always had grudges against them, uh, against the friend group, I should say. But anyway, when they exit this this house, the shack shack. And they're back in the school grounds. Uh, something that is important to mention as well is that this night was a full moon night. Which meant that Professor Snape had followed them, but he also had the potion. Well, he meant to give the potion to uh, Professor Lupin. Called, and this is the Wolf's Bane potion, which normally it cures against uh, becoming a werewolf but also uh, for Professor Lupin who was past that point of being cured it helped him kind of keep his consciousness his control but having not drank that potion well you can see what's going to happen uh, the full moon is out is out Professor Lupin transforms to a werewolf runs away well, he runs away because Sirius transforms, transfigures himself into a dog to uh, kind of protect the children. Harry and Hermione run after them, runs to her to actually run. And they end up over by the lake. And the thing is that over at the lake, they find Sirius. Uh, he's already back into his human form. But now you have Dementor start flying in. And the Dementors are causing Harry to be weak, Hermione to be weak, Harry's about to die, Sirius is about to die. Well, I say die, but it's actually a little bit worse because you see, Dementors, what they like to do is give what's known as Dementors Kiss, which basically they suck your soul, so you're just kind of like this tusk of a human. And as they already had the permission to do so for Sirius, and they're not going to stop with Sirius. I mean, they're if somebody else is there, they're also going to give them the kiss. Before Harry loses consciousness, he does see this glowing light, uh, which runs the Dementors over. When Harry turns to see who has cast the spell, he sees who he thinks might be his father. Because... In the figure, it looks like his father. It looks like he has glasses like his father. Harry thinks it's his father. As crazy as it might seem because his father has already passed away. Back at the at the nurse at the nursery, uh, Harry regains consciousness and he hears that Sirius is locked up. And he's trying to kind of talk to Professor Dumbledore who just got in. Um, with the minister because they are wanting to uh, execute well not execute but you know have the dementors perform the, the kiss on Sirius and so because that doesn't happen they actually have Sirius uh, well obviously he's locked up but as they're exiting uh, Dumbledore does turn back with Hermione and gives her kind of this, this cryptic message. Three turns should do the trick. And the question is, well, what is he talking about? That's when Hermione reveals 
what she has been doing throughout the whole school year. Because you see, one of the, the reason why she had been called in to Professor McGonagall's office was that because she was taking extra, extra classes, basically she was taking all the classes that she could take that were available as a third year, meaning that even the classes that were happening at the same time, she was attending both classes without any attendance issues. The reason why she was able to do that is that she had she was given, well, she was loaned a special magical artifact called a time turner. A time turner allows you to go back in time. And the reason why it's a little bit dangerous is because if you're seen by your past self, there is a possibility that you might kill yourself unintentionally. So your past self will kill your future self or vice versa. It, it can be complicated and it things have happened before. So the fact that she has a time turner is a big deal. It means that she's responsible. Now, when they go back in time, uh, Ron isn't able to go with them because of his leg, but Ron and her, I mean, um, Harry and Hermione, they go back in time, they go through the execution once more, but they find they figure out what they have to do. Um, in a sense, they save Buckbeak, which is before the executioner kind of comes out, sees that Buckbeak is no longer there after seeing Buckbeak there the first time, but being mad he still swings the axe and that's kind of like the sound that they had first heard of initially uh, they hide with Buckbeak over in the forest and when Hagrid is, done, is gone they eventually hide in Hagrid's hut they see themselves going into the tree then exit the tree along with Sirius and Professor Snape um, and everybody I should say they also see when the Dementors arrive. Now, Harry notices that no, but he might have a chance to see his father. Because he's still adamant about his father saving him. Harry exits the hut. He gets closer to the lake. He notices that nobody's there. Nobody, The person, whoever it is, who casts the spell is not there. And then it becomes a question of if nothing... If the person doesn't come soon... He is going to die because the Dementors are already performing the kiss on Sirius and they're ready to perform the kiss on him. So Harry did, it really dawns on Harry at that moment that who he saw wasn't his father. It was himself. Many times he has heard people say, you look like James except for your eyes. So understandably, when he was looking from across the lake, the shadowy figure, well, he looks like his father, so he confused himself as his father. And he performs the expected Protonus. And this special Protonus comes out as a full bodied, a corporeous um, expected Protonus. It comes out in the shape of a stag, his father, a source of pride for him. And that stag is what drives the Dementors away, and it's a very powerful incantation. Because where it's already difficult when it's against one Dementor, now against hundreds, well, I don't know the exact number, but, you know... One, expression protonus being effective against a whole horde of Dementors. Now, that is truly a powerful incantation. And so they see, um, you know, his past self and also Sirius get saved. They're brought into the castle. Sirius is already in one of the floors in one of the towers. I believe, it, I believe it's in one of the astronomy towers. It's in one of the higher rooms. That's when they get Buckbeak, they fly over, and they help Sirius escape. And Sirius escapes with Buckbeak. So, in essence, they saved two lives, Sirius and Buckbeak. 
what it causes, and and you actually see it um, in in the movie. You see how bad it is living with the Dursleys when Harry. Not only does he know, but Sirius does also mention to Harry that he is his godfather. And that in time, once nobody was kind of hunting him down, because they were going to still hunt him down, um, thanks to Pedro escaping. So now they don't have that uh, witness or that source of... uh, of truth that they could, there, there was no way of getting the truth out. That no, Sirius didn't kill Peter Pettigrew. He wasn't a the killer. There's no reason to lock him up. Well, Peter Pettigrew escaped basically during the whole altercation with the werewolf. So he told Harry, you know, once everything settles down, maybe, and you know, he was a little bit hesitant, but maybe you would want to stay with me instead of with the Dursleys. But I understand if you don't want to stay with me. Harry, having just known him for a few hours, immediately says that he wants to live with him. When can he start living with him? And at that moment, Sirius... It's the start of a beautiful relationship. It's at that moment that Sirius stops being just an ex-convict but he also starts becoming the godfather the fatherly figure that Harry has wanted and that he was looking for not in the sense that oh he's the source of kind of like this uh, protection and all that but because he is one of the few links Sirius is one of the few links that he has to his father, which we have already established. James is a source of pride for Harry. And so seeing him go, it is kind of sad. Well, when he's flying off with Buffick, it does cause sadness with Harry because finally he has met this one person who has some sort of connection with him. And not only recognizes that there's a connection, but actually wants to be with him. Who actually wants him as part of their lives. But he is on the run. He cannot stay with him. Compared to the Dursleys, you know, you have to think, how bad is it with the Dursleys that a stranger who he barely knew for a few hours, he would prefer to immediately live with them. Then, with the Dursleys. That is saying something. Well, they they are able to get to the back to the nurse wing, um, to the nursery to where they're supposed to be. Right, they, they finally get there on time before anybody notices that they are missing, and you know that is that. Ron is still not sure what happened because from his perspective, they disappeared when Hermione brought the trim- turner out. Uh, she had it underneath her blouse, I think. But, you know, once she took it out and did the spin, he only saw them disappear. And then all of, all of a sudden, they're coming inside. So he goes, what is going on? Well, I'll tell you later. And so that's how it kind of concludes. Well, kind of, because you see... When they're coming back on the Hogwarts train, a curiously tropical colorful bird comes up to the window. And it's a message from Sirius. And it's basically, you know, if you have any troubles, just let me know and I'm here. And, and it, okay, it, it is kind of funny, you know, because at the very end, like in one of the final scenes, uh, he meets the Thursdays and then says, oh, yeah. Um, do you remember that uh, ex-convict that escaped? Yeah, it turns out that he's my godfather, so you might want to be nice. If he hasn't heard from me in a couple of weeks, 
or he if does he doesn't hear from me from time to time, you know, there's going to be trouble. And at that moment, they are they start letting him release his owl Hedwig to fly off into the night because usually they have her locked up because they want uh, anybody to kind of they don't want to attract any unwanted attention. And so that's come the end of the third book, Prisoner of Azkaban. And, you know, I, I do want to say that it is a fantastic book. And as a movie, it also is an enjoyable movie. Again, you get to meet a little bit more. You have a little bit more context on James, especially James Potter, the father. Because all the time you hear, oh, Lily and James were wonderful, and you look like James. You have uh, your mother's eyes. You know, he Harry starts hearing a lot of compliments, but not much about who his parents were. And so by having this connection through Professor Lupin, this connection through Sirius, because in the end, they knew very well his parents. And by having this connection, this life connection, it his parents are no longer part of a story, part of a legend. They are more tangible. He can now actually feel a connection with his parents. They are no longer far away. They're inside of him. They're a part of him. They're a part of who he is. They're a part of his story. And they'll continue being, they'll continue to be a part of his story in everything they do. And that is wonderful. It's wonderful how a book can comfort, can, you know, really conjure these emotions. That's awesome. That's great. But anyway, I think I talked long enough. Um, I'm just not, I'm not going to edit this video at all. I'm just going to upload it. I still have a couple of videos that are kind of lagging behind. But anyway, uh, leave a comment if you have any suggestions for future videos, future reviews, or rants, whatever you want to call this. Also, what do you, how do you find this format more like a podcast? Uh, I enjoy it. I don't know how to fight with the camera, but. We'll see. So, talk to you later. Bye-bye.